We begin today's meditation on the book of Ezra. Ezra. Many scholars look at Ezra and Nehemiah together. But uh, let's, we're starting with Ezra. And Ezra has to do with the return of the people of Israel from exile, from Babylon, back to the land of Israel, back to Jerusalem. But we begin our reflections on Ezra with the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, this book was written about 150 to 200 years before the letter or the book of Ezra. 150 to 200 years before. Those are th- that's pretty much the date of the, um, the, the book of Isaiah, the space that Isaiah covers. But in, in chapter 45, chapter 45, starting from verse 1, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you. Though you do not know me, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that the people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. (laughs) Majestic prophecy from the book of Isaiah, naming King Cyrus 150 to 200 years before the book of Ezra, which begins, chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever among you of all his people, may his God be with him, And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. In order to fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah that the Israelites would return to the land of Judah and to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Cyrus, King Cyrus, makes this proclamation. Now, was he aware of the prophecy that was, uh, that was given 100 to 200 years ago by Isaiah? Some people have said, yes, that he was aware. And because he was aware and impressed with the fact that he himself was named so long ago as the one to be used by God to return the people of Israel back to their land, that he strove to make it happen. Possibly, 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 definitely possible. But then there are scholars who say, no, 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 the date is wrong. Isaiah's date cannot be that early. You know what their reason is? Because if you follow Isaiah, God would be naming Cyrus 150 to 200 years before Cyrus was born, or Cyrus' time. Chronology doesn't work, and so Isaiah has to, be, have, has to have been written later. You know why that doesn't make sense, don't you? You know why that can't be right? Because it begins with the premise that the supernatural is impossible. But if you say that the supernatural is possible, which in our worldview, of course, it is possible. Our God created the worlds out of nothing. And certainly, as it stands, 
as the rest of the evidence of the of the passages indicate, Isaiah is 150 to 200 years before the time of Cyrus. Then clearly, God, in His sovereignty, named the Cyrus, and His in His providence brought the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah to fulfillment, at least in part, in returning the people, his people, back to Jerusalem. Wow. Then what is the message of the book of Ezra? Certainly the message of the book of Ezra, the message, the message is the faithfulness of God in fulfilling his word, that God is faithful. Because at the end of the day, it's not Cyrus who is delivering. It is God who is working through Cyrus. And you say, wait a minute, but God did use Cyrus to make this happen. Yes. But Cyrus, too, is a messianic figure, isn't he? What does it say? My anointed Cyrus. The language of anointing is the language of the Messiah. That's what Messiah means. That's what Christ means, the anointed one. So King Cyrus is a shadow of the Messiah that is to come. And the Messiah that is to come, for us the Messiah that has come, King Jesus, is the very personification, is the very providence, the sovereign providence, the providing, promise-fulfilling presence of God in human form. That's who Jesus is. And he was that? At the time of Ezra, he was that. At the time of Isaiah, he is that in our times and in our struggles too. Even though we may lose sight of his faithfulness, passages like this remind us, his past faithfulness reminds us of his present continued faithfulness in our lives as well. In your struggle, please remember, we were designed to struggle this life is called a battle, and it's not a call to battle for nothing. It is meant for us to grow through the struggles, go, grow through the tensions, grow through the misunderstandings, and grow through the, all the attacks of the enemy. We are not ignorant of his ways. So, loved one, God is faithful in the midst of all of that to even use the methods of the enemy for his glory and for our good. As you look at Ezra, you will find that that's exactly what he did. That he, he refined the people of Israel in exile so that when they came back, there was no more idolatry. They were pulling away from the worldly influences and striving after holiness and purity, at least better than they were before. So, it is my call to you as we look at Jesus, the fulfillment of the promise-keeping providence of God, that we will look back on his providence that has his faithfulness throughout all of human history, his faithfulness to you and to me, and to rejoice in it in spite of our circumstances and beat them into submission, Leverage all of the difficulties of life, your headache that you are having right now, your misunderstanding that has caused a rift between you and somebody you care about, that in the midst of that, that you would be a warrior that reflects the warrior prince, our God, our King, King Jesus, who faithfully, faithfully keeps us even at this moment and keeps his promises even right now. Let's pray. King Jesus, thank you for being everything that Cyrus had been called to be, that Cyrus prefigured. Thank you for your faithfulness that you had you displayed over hundreds, even thousands of years. The faithfulness that brought us to you, that drew, drew us to you. Help us, Lord, never to rely on ourselves, but rely on you alone. Look to the victory that you have won and the faithfulness by which you keep us, the faithfulness that was put on display last Lord's Day as we got to worship you with our hearts, from our hearts. And so, Lord, we pray that we would feed on your faithfulness and delight in you this day. Jesus, in your beautiful name we pray.
Amen.